So this evening I am joined by former motorcycle racer and musician James Toseland. So James, first and foremost, how are you keeping this evening? Um, nearly getting into the summer and Moto G calen MotoGP calendar has uh, well and truly kicked off. So how are you getting on? Uh, everything's good. Um, former motorcycle racer, but I still play a bit. There you go. Look, I'll prove it. <laughs> I still play a bit. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever retire from that. But uh, no, everything's fine. Thanks, Holt. It's uh, it's been a busy start to the year with the the, the World Superbikes kicking off. Um, it's been a bit of a dominant performance at the minute from uh, for certain Spaniard Alvaro Bautista. Um, but it's it's incredible to to watch how he's riding. It's just uh, difficult for for the fans to uh, get close racing at the minute. But hopefully that'll change. Um, but uh, but no, all's good. Everything's going well. So I suppose we'll start off with kind of, you know, getting to know you a little bit better and sort of how you, um, where you came from and your background, I suppose, and how you got into motorcycle racing. I know, obviously, you know, when you get interviews, this is probably uh, the first question you'll get asked. But, you know, I suppose for people kind of that might not necessarily know about you, James, um, where did you come from and where did your love for motorcycle racing come from? Oh, I came from, I was born in Doncaster, then I was then went moved to Sheffield, uh, where my mum and dad uh, split up. We moved into my grandparents' house, and that's where the love of piano playing came from, because my grand was a, a beautiful piano player, and she taught me to play. And then my mum met a new boyfriend when I was eight, nine years old, and that's when the motorcycles came into it, because uh, he had a motorcycle on the road. He had a, um, a, a YZF 1000 X up at that time, uh, and I was fascinated by it. And, um, he, uh, I, I then he bought me one for Christmas, a trials bike, T Y T, and and then we went out together and riding in in the forest around Derbyshire and that, and, and I just absolutely fell in love with with motorcycle. I didn't even know what a motorcycle was before I was nine, um, yeah. but as soon as I jumped on one and then uh, rode with uh, with Ken, it was just uh, it was just I was just introduced to. I was lucky in life. I was I was I've been introduced to some two things that I just couldn't stop doing because I adore, I adored them so much. And so it's uh, I was lucky that my grand taught me the piano and, and, and Ken taught me the bikes. And since then, mm. uh, to have a whole career at it, though, it was, has been um, has been really fortunate. Yeah, I'm sure it's kind of a, a surreal moment when you start to kind of think back and kind of I always wonder that, you know, when people like yourself are sort of interviewed and you're kind of going back upon what you've achieved. And it's kind of like it must sort of until I suppose I remember reading somewhere until it's kind of all over. You know, I don't think it actually really hits you. Uh, because you, you nearly feel as if you've like woken up from some sort of dream. Do you know what I mean? It is. It is. Because, um, you know, your reality is your reality, isn't it? And then I think as you get uh, to my ripe old age and you retire, just whether you retire from injury that I had to or just naturally through age, I think it then takes a good decade for you to actually look back and go, wow, that I actually I actually did all that. Because you even yeah. watch yourself um, sometimes when you see the old racing on the clips, and and when you watch what you used to do, you can't believe that you did were, were even able to do that. And <laughs> it is surreal watching it back and 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 all the crowd and um and all the you know the intensity to it to life mm -hmm. um, of waking up every day and and wanting and needing to be better than yesterday every single day to try and be world the, the world's best at something. Mm -hmm. It's just a really intense existence, and um, I think that's why when it stops. That's why it takes a lot of readjusting to to normal life because uh, to to be a racer and to or to just to be a professional sports person um, to try and achieve the ultimate goal in life um, that they, they can't there's no space for anything else to consider mm -hmm. so uh, and that's including anything normal and anything normal is just trivial but when all the trivial stuff becomes normal it takes some readjusting but it it's but I, I you know I would have rather have had and lost than to have never have had that's for sure. Oh, absolutely. And just kind of on that note, when you say, you know, you get up to sort of your reality, you know, what was it that I suppose drove you to get up and to go racing and to keep striving to be better than, you know, the guy behind you or to keep winning? Like, what was it, I suppose? Was it just that kind of hunger to succeed or, you know, what was it that kind of made you tick, I suppose? I was naturally competitive as a kid, hated losing. I've got and I've got an older brother as well. And I think that like instills yes absolutely. it can't not instill um competition in you because yes, if you're a younger right, sibling, yeah and especially if you're the younger one you've got to fight for it you know i know yeah <laughs> from 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 your chips to your you know to the football game everything's a competition to try and get as much yeah. as you can before your brother gets it uh, and it's um and, and i and i think the younger sibling definitely has a little bit of that going on <clears throat> i certainly did 
Um, but with my, my natural temperament of being competitive um, and who I was, to, to fly around a motorcycle track at 200 miles an hour was just perfect for who I was. And, and it, I was able to uh, kind of um, channel all of that into this amazing sport and it, it and it just ticked all the boxes for me and there wasn't ever a day that I ever went fast enough you know I yeah. always wanted to go faster and motorcycle racing there isn't you know I've, I've done skydiving I've, I've done bungee jumping I've done uh, I've seen them you name it and nothing comes close to it than yeah. to go down Paddock Hill Bend at Brands Hatch uh, in front of 120,000 people um, and it, um, it's just surreal uh, ex, uh, you know, levels of excitement. And like I say, the intensity to your life is it, just incredible. And it's, it's, it's fascinating how it affects people uh, mentally. But uh, I was very fortunate to, um, you know, practiced and dedicated myself every single day to developing a talent that, that was able to go on stages that big and not just kind of compete, but also win, which is a big difference. Um, mm-hmm. Because there's a lot of people in my life, in my era, that that finished second, which they should have been a champion at some time, but didn't yeah. through various reasons, and their life's dramatically different to one that's been the champion. Um, mm-hmm. I suppose Absolutely. it's like the like the hundred meter runners, you know, like the uh, everybody could probably run off five hundred meter hundred meter Olympic champions, right? Yeah. But it's pretty impossible to run off five silver medalists. Mm-hmm. If you know, if oh, you know absolutely, what I mean. yeah. And it's, it's so it's kind of the, that thing of being the bridesmaid, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, and yeah. but it's you, you can't underestimate just how huge it is for everything in your life that that comes from you know even down to you know just the trivial finances to it or just um, just the perception from people that you have in your life um, um, to to the respect from everybody once you've achieved the ultimate goal. It's it's mm-hmm. um, you know it it is a it, it's a real privilege to have kind of succeeded at it. Mm, no absolutely and then I suppose just kind of going back slightly you know as a 13 or 14 year old teenager where at the time did you go to to obviously start your journey in the sport Um, I, you know I'm, I'm aware kind of there was a junior sort of road race association was that kind of where you started was that kind of how you progressed on to you know achieving what you achieved it was yeah junior road racing association was the first championship that I competed in in 1995 and it was great um, you know, myself, James Ellison, Steve Brogan, John Woodcock, uh, Ross Connolly, um, uh, the, the, there was a, um, a lot of good names, Mark Heckles, a lot of good names that did very, very well professional races from that one or two years of, of the Junior Road Racing Association. So, mm-hmm. um, and it was, uh, yeah, great. I didn't know, but it was a great year to compete at that time in that in that period to then move on progressively to, to super teams the year after and mm-hmm. and then on to cb 500s but um it was a really good platform yeah and then obviously kind of subsequently after that then you you know you started off in the bsb paddock um, and moved then into world Superbikes. so you know started off at uh, your career in british Superbikes. tell us a little bit about that i know you you rode for uh, paul bird for a year Yes, Paul Bird's very first year in, in British Superbikes itself with the Honda SP1. And there was uh, John McGuinness on a 250 and there was uh, Stuart Easton on a 125. So we kind of, we covered, Paul Bird covered all championships back then. And it was really fun. It was only me that raced uh, in the team. Not There wasn't a two-man team. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were a bit behind the curve because we only got the bike two weeks before the season started. So but... I had to test through the winter on a, a, a on his twin uh, 500 Grand Prix bike through the winter time. So that was fun at, uh, at Mallory Park, I remember. But uh, but now great great times and just great experience to hone my skills. I was only 19 years old, and obviously back then a 19 year old wrestling superbike round was quite unusual. Um, yeah, of course. What I didn't realise was that Birdie. Because he wanted me to put me on super sport, but but I wanted I wanted to move up to super bike, and so Birdie kind of took the risk on on bringing a youngster on, and uh, he he did that for me. I'm very grateful that he, he gave me that experience because that one year of experience and the potential that I was able to show in in 2000 uh, moved me on to world super bike straight away. So uh, got a lot, a lot to thank for Paul Bird and his team. And obviously, two world superbike championships, uh, you know, came from that. And um, I suppose just briefly kind of tell us a little bit about what it is that kind of 
what it takes, I suppose, to actually be there and to be at the top, you know, week in, week out and to subsequently win a championship like that, because, you know, it's not for the faint hearted. You know, I'm sure a lot of hard work had to go in behind the scenes. And I suppose talks through a little bit about what you had to do, you know, from your side of things. You know, obviously you were given the machines, but what what did you have to do from an athlete's perspective to actually, you know, be up there and to 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 win that? Resilience, I'd say. Resilience, I've put one of the top lists uh, on, on top of a list of, of attributes, personal attributes um, uh, that, that you, that's, re, that's needed, as well as consistency and dedication, mm-hmm. obviously. But, you know, the dedication come, comes naturally if, if you really. And there's a difference between wanting something and needing something. I, yeah. I needed to, to be successful and I needed to win. Uh, that, that was the intensity to it. So mm-hmm. the... Uh, uh, the dedication wasn't ever a problem because I, I just adored my job and I adored racing motorcycles. And I was very fortunate to work with amazing teams that provided me with a motorcycle that always gave me an opportunity to keep the faith and keep the hope and keep the belief in my inner confidence yeah. um, uh, that that I could achieve such uh, uh, goals. Because mm-hmm. anybody that goes to World Championship in their first two years when they don't know the tracks against the best in the world you know you've got the american champion the spanish champion the italian champion they're they're, they're all very very talented people mm-hmm. and when you go and you've got such lack of experience with traveling and the circuits uh, and everything that 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 comes to it that um that, that you haven't got experience on it's just really difficult um because it's impossible to be competitive time-wise when you go to a track for the first time against the world guys so it's uh, one thing I was really fortunate was working with teams that understood that when I was only 20 years old in World Superbikes and gave me realistic goals to 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 achieve for them. Um, and I just kept ticking the boxes for them when I finished like 13th in my very first race and then 11th, then 7th and then 3rd. Um, uh, they allowed me to develop and they allowed me to develop and said that 13th this weekend would be a great achievement. You know, mm-hmm. I never, I never joined a team other than the factory to get a team in, in Wales of life where you've got to win. Um, but by then I, I, I'd learned enough to win, but, um, but in my primitive years in, with, with GSE racing with Neil Hodgson, uh, they gave me achievable goals to hit um, uh, and didn't put too much pressure on. And that was, that was the making of, of why I won uh, after my third year in it. So again, a lot to thank of the team being patient to to develop a talent. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously 2011 came and, you know, you announced your retirement from the sport. Um, still, you know, a young man um, and, you know, obviously still you fulfilled a lot in the sport. But, you know, as you said earlier, I think uh, before I started recording this, you, you know, you said it, it was obviously through injury. And how sort of how sort of, you know, mentally challenging is that? to actually accept that you know it's through sort of not a course of action of your own that you now have to stop doing what you love how kind of hard was that to sort of you know was it easy to get over or did you did it take time to process no horrible it was a really horrible confusing period of who you are it's just self-identity because you've dedicated yourself and you've become somebody especially in the public eye as well because you're you're the guy that excuse me you're the guy that rides and you're the racer Mm-hmm. And you feel without that um, attachment to that, um, it's it's like you know Superman has just taken his superpowers away, and yeah. and you've just got to now live amongst the society um, mm-hmm. normally, and you haven't done that ever, especially now these families are, are starting their children even younger. I mean, I mean I was fourteen the first time I did road racing. I mean the thought of getting your son into road racing now at fourteen is unheard of. Like 14 year old kids now they're ready for motor gp almost i know yeah yeah because they've started at five so if yeah. i feel that when i in my era i mean it must be even worse now because that's all kids have ever known is riding a motorcycle so yeah it's, absolutely but it's um you know I, I i mine was unexpected up with an injury but um it, it if i could kind of compare it to anything it's like a just a bereavement of of a loss of a, of a real deal family member that yeah. um that you know we've all unfortunately uh, experienced um, and it, it takes about 10 years for that to settle in a place where life's okay now without that person or without that career and life's kind of it's taken a new to a new path um, and you know everything 
everything passes. Whatever difficulty your life is, if I had one message for getting over stuff, everything will pass Mm -hmm. as long as you're good to yourself. You know, Um, if you go down the the, the drink or drugs or anything else to mask it, uh, it's impossible for it for you to heal and for your life to move forward in a positive way. You're Mm -hmm. actually making it impossible for your life to move forward in a a, a positive way. And just on that, that's, I suppose, from an athlete's perspective and, you know, from you know you're involved in the sport at that at that high performance level you know I, a lot of what kind of you know rehabilitation centers and you know those kind of you know uh, people in in those uh, industries a lot of the people that come into them are high profile you know sports people um or actors or actresses because they're just as you say it's such an intense way of living and to have that taken away from you um it's a massive thing and i don't think people you know normalize it enough that you know this is one of the pitfalls and the side effects of you know the sport and the industry that you know this is this is real that you know these are real human beings and this is how it affects them do you know what I mean and I yeah. think that's a massive thing that you know that you know races of today know that there is that sort of support network out there for them you know in be it professional or just you know to family and friends and to not be you know obviously it's it's such a you know after all the accolades that you have achieved and you know people like you in in the superbike championship and you know you become very proud I think and I think it's hard to then you know come back to reality and go Jesus I'm struggling today like do you know what I mean because obviously all you've known is to be that person that's up on the top step of the rostrum do you know what I mean and it's hard to adjust and I think that's you know a massive thing that you know it's a big message that should be, you know, obviously uh, portrayed loud and clear to, you know, this younger generation of motorcycle racers and the current motorcycle racers of, you know, 2023 and in the, yeah. the various different uh, championships, because just from even my point of view, it's just it's so prevalent in the sport, you know, and I think it's one of those things. It's getting in is easy, but getting out is harder because either you're trying to get out on your own terms and you're like hesitant as to when's the right time to do it. Cause as you say, you're leaving that family member behind. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you're, you know, if the decision is made for you and it's through injury, then, you know, I think it's, they're, they're both equal really, because it's kind of like you're leaving at some point and you're leaving in some sort of way, shape or form. So it's yeah. like, you know what I mean? It's just such a, mm-hmm. a big thing, I think, to try and cope with on your own. It is. And, and, and if you're lucky to be a professional sportsman, and you dedicate yourself and you stay away from injury um mm-hmm. you'll do well to have a 15-year career at it mm-hmm. and just take into consideration that you know if you're lucky you'll live to 80 or 90 you know you can you can work out the maths that that ain't a, a massive period of your life no but it, but it's a period of your life that is so intense that um, um the, the, the the kind of pyramid of of on the way up and on the way down is so severe um, just to take, for example, somebody that drinks too much coffee, takes too much caffeine, and then they stop, you know, you'll get the shakes and you get a headache uh, quite a lot to, to wean yourself off caffeine. Mm-hmm. Well, if you if you times that by a thousand, the endorphins through your brain racing motorcycles around at those speeds, oh, um, you've got to put it into perspective just how much of a, an, a, a drug for a human being this is. And mm-hmm. you put then success on the top of that with standing on the podium, listening to your national anthem, spraying the champagne and the adulation of, of, of thousands of people. Uh, you can you can times that by another thousand. And it's uh, uh, and, and th- but there's very little to wean sports people off what they do, because we haven't seen it enough as, as it's a drug that, um, you know, for if you get injured or if you, if you lose your career because you're of your age. There needs to be a better system for just having a, a bit of a softer fall on the other side yeah, of, understand, of understanding that. Sort of wean you into it. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Because you know, if you've dedicated yourself so much to doing it and getting that good, the chances are you're not great at not. Are you not very good at much else? Yeah, I know. Well, that's what a lot of a lot of racers, you know, and even just sports people in general would say that. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like this is all I know. You know what I mean? Because they've given so much thought and just time and effort to this one thing that yeah. if they're to go and just uh, you know work in the bank or oh sure just go and get a job as a, a labourer or whatever they're like I don't, I don't know and it's just and then of course you're doing that as kind of a you know this is now your new job but nothing as you say is ever going to come close to what you did because 
it's just like that intensity, that pure just thrill. It's you can't find that from anything else, I don't think. And I think that's the challenge, you know, and, you know, uh, kind of moving on to what I was going to ask you next, you know, your kind of career now in sort of BT sport and, you know, kind of on the, the sort of commentary side of things and the presenting side of things like you're still within the sport, but like, do you still find sometimes you're looking down and you're kind of going, oh, God, like, you know, or have you kind of now have you accepted is that right my career is over this is my job I had a great time or is there still part of you kind of goes that you nearly have sort of something left unfulfilled perhaps yes but I think it, to be a professional sportsman I think you're going to have that curse until to the last day that's yeah. the problem because um if you we're just not content people <laughs> <laughs> contentment is the is is the the magic potion that I wish we could all have when it all ends and and because the lack of contentment in your natural personality to be the best at something uh, like it, it's not even in your it's not even in your dictionary because it can't be because you can't be content with anything it has to be better and you've got to be better and you've got to be faster you've got to be stronger whatever so it's um having having contentment in your life is is uh, is a real um is is a real joy but it's uh, but it, it but I'm 42 now and 43 this year and I'm thankful that just my natural age I can feel now that um, mm-hmm. I can look back with immense pride and enjoyment but but also also look at it and and kind of be thankful that I'm actually just included and still um, amongst this amazing sport and to to bring to add something because I do the commentating now and that's a bit of a new thing yeah. for the last couple of years and I, I feel that I can if I really commentate with energy and excitement and enthusiasm to 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 the race I can actually provide um, some some part of the show still with commentary yeah absolutely um, you're kind of you're bringing you're bringing uh, the action to us at home I guess do you know what I mean yeah. and if, through that I think you're getting to nearly live it and still get a bit of a thrill maybe it is it's a big responsibility commentary when you do just pundit when you just start at the side of the presenter and you're just asking answering questions about the reaction of what you've seen that that it's not as fulfilling as actually providing something uh, uh, that goes alongside the action which which is yeah. commentary you know absolutely. so it's much more exciting for sure absolutely and then coming off the bike train and back onto uh, this object that is behind you. Um, <laughs> obviously music, you just said your grandmother, you know, uh, taught you the piano. It's been a massive part of your life as well. And after racing, or was this while you were still racing, you had your own band? Yeah, but while I was while I was racing for 10 years, I played in a covers band called Crash and that was great fun. We, yeah. we went to Vegas for the Yamaha launch, the oh Yamaha one. Because um, all, all, obviously with Yamaha, I've got, I've got bikes and pianos, so... It, you know, well, one of the biggest pride um, uh, things that that I was really proud of was was in Japan. I rode MotoGP for the first time ever because the Yamaha music guy gave the Yamaha motorcycle engineer his name of Yamaha for his motorcycles back in the day. We're going back some, um, yeah. and gave him the three tuning forks logo, which is slightly different with the bikes and the piano. The tuning forks, they don't hit, because it's a circle, the Yamaha logo, the tuning forks don't hit the outer circle on the, uh, the, the bikes compared to the music. There's a few little uh, subtle differences. Okay. And, ra- and randomly, um, oh, that's not Yamaha, but um, the, the M, the middle of the M of uh, the music, the middle doesn't go with the same uh, length as the outer bits of the M. <laughs> <laughs> so two random facts uh, about, because okay. there wasn't too much connection to it. And the boss of the Yamaha music came to Motegi, the MotoGP, to watch his very first motorcycle race because I did a I did a performance with the pianos in the factory over there, right. and that was amazing because when the Yamaha boss walked into the garage of the Yamaha engineers, they were all like, "Wow, this, uh, our our big bosses come who let us even have the name." So that was that was really something. And obviously, the Yamaha connection uh, was was a really just a special two or three years. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I suppose just before we finish up, you know, just give us kind of like James Toesland now in 2023. What are you up to? Who are you? And where are you looking to go next? Um, Ooh, crikey, that's a big, that's a big question. Um, 
I've got. I, 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 I had. I've had seven operations on my wrist, and they and and six of them failed. Uh, and the the last one failed, and it it was it's been quite traumatic recovering from all the operations, and uh, so they had to fuse it on the last one. So it, it literally fixed. It doesn't bend at all. Um, right. So it, uh, uh, and but there's a, a, a there's a, a surgeon in America in Texas that says there's a new procedure now where you can reverse the fuse and put this special cartridge in and can get 50% movement back. Because I've not been able to play. The piano that much which then the band yeah. kind of took a side step especially with covid and all the rest of it so yeah. uh, on the 27th of october i have a flight well like i've got an operation booked um and i'm i'm just building up the the courage to do an eighth operation and try and get some movement which then will put me back behind a piano which then i'll i'll do a third album hopefully and then i'll be back on the road with a band and um and yeah and so that's 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 the big thing this year of making oh, a amazing. decision for that. Well, yeah. very best to look with that. Hopefully it um hopefully it works. And yeah, no, I, there's to be honest, the states for anything like that, even just down to um I know James was saying, you know, stem cell treatment and stuff for, you know, nerves and getting feeling back and stuff, you know, it's just so so advanced, do you know what I mean, it in is. comparison to this side of the world. So um no, that's absolutely fantastic. You know, it the is. things they can do now is just unbelievable. It is, yeah, because with a fixed wrist it is awkward to play. I can play, but not not kind of confidently enough to perform, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, um, I know, I know. And especially getting up in front of people as well. It's always a bit like, oh gosh, there's an, an yeah. extra added pressure like, you know. It um well, I, I wish you the very best to look with that. And look at thank you thank so you. much for coming on and uh, and chatting and telling us a little bit about who James Toesland is and your career to date. And uh, yeah, wish you the very best of luck and yes, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.